Hello everyone, and welcome to the final episode of War in Middle-Earth. In this video, we'll talk about the aftermath of the War of the Ring, and how the world would change going into the Fourth Age. These are the bittersweet years. An age-old enemy has fallen, but with him goes the end of an era, the last echoes of the older days. For better or worse, the world will now experience the Dominion of Men. In the previous episode, we covered the scouring of the Shire, and the Battle of Bywater, the final battle of the War of the Ring. Starting on the 30th of June 3018 and ending on the 3rd of November 3019 and consisting of over a dozen major battles, the War of the Ring has been the largest and most important conflict of the Third Age. Tens of thousands have been killed, great heroes have been sacrificed, and many lands have been burned and pillaged. But Sauron has been defeated, and he shall not rise again. The defeat of Sauron has immediate impacts on the entire world. For the people of Gondor and the Western Lands, Sauron has been the great enemy for generations, thousands of years. Mordor has been the eternal threat, a dark cloud on the horizon that always threatened to roll over the lands of the Free Peoples. Opposing him has been a long, slow defeat, but with his destruction, the Free Peoples now have the opportunity to heal, to make safe their lands, and dwell in a better, brighter future. This is especially true in Gondor, which has not had a lasting peace for over 500 years. But change doesn't just come for the Free Peoples. In the vast lands of the East and South, many different peoples had dwelt under Sauron's unyielding rule for hundreds or even thousands of years. Under his tyranny, it cannot be doubted that some people prospered, many of those worshipping him as a god-king, but many also languished, enslaved, or forced to fight in wars far from home. The destruction of Sauron is a new beginning for all of these peoples, an opportunity to forge their own path, without the lordship or manipulation of a brutal tyrant. For some, this is the dawn of a new day, but for others, it's the unthinkable, the worst possible outcome, and there will undoubtedly be a power vacuum in Sauron's former dominions for many years to come. On the 1st of May, 3019, Aragorn returns to Minas Tirith with the host of the West, and outside the gates of Minas Tirith, Faramir surrenders his authority as steward and lord of Gondor, and recognises Aragorn as the rightful king of Gondor, Thus, Aragorn is crowned as King Alessar of the House of Telcontar, which means Strider in Quenya. He proclaims the foundation of the Reunited Kingdom, which will consist of many of the lands that once made up both Arnor and Gondor. Shortly after his coronation, Alessar discovers a sapling of the White Tree high on the slopes of Mount Minduluin, and a new White Tree is planted to signify the years of prosperity to come. In the days that follow the coronation, representatives from many different realms and peoples begin to arrive in Minas Tirith. This includes representatives from Dale and the Lonely Mountain, from the Vales of Anduin and Mirkwood, from Lothlorien and Rivendell, and representatives even arrive from formerly hostile lands such as Harad, Rune, and Dunland. Elessa makes other decrees as well. The region of Nern in Mordor South is to be given to the men that Sauron once enslaved there, the Druidan Forest is to be made an independent enclave within the Reunited Kingdom's borders. Friendly realms such as Dale and Erebor will have the friendship and protection of the Reunited Kingdom, and that Isengard is to be granted to the Ents, and will henceforth be known as the Treegarth of Isengard. Elessa and King Eomer of Rohan also renew the Oath of Kirion, that both kingdoms would aid each other in the times of need and stay in perpetual friendship. In the years that follow, Elessar gets to work organising the reunited kingdom. In Gondor, the southern half of his new realm, Faramir is kept in his role as steward, and is made chief of the newly formed Great Council of Gondor. Elessar also names Faramir as Prince of Aphelion, and gives him leave to dwell in the hills of Emin Arnon, near to the river Anduin. A few years into the Fourth Age, Legolas settles a colony of Wood Elves in Aphelion, and with their help, it becomes the fairest land in Middle-earth. As for Minas Morgul, Elessar commands that it is to be utterly destroyed and cleansed, and that men will not live there for many years to come. As for the former capital of Osgiliath, its fate is unknown, but given its location, it would be reasonable to assume that it was slowly rebuilt. As for the northern realm of Arnor, the rebuilding process will be much slower, owing to the lack of people and infrastructure. The city of Anumanas was made habitable once again and Gandalf expected that Fornos to reign would be rebuilt as well. The town of Bree and the surrounding villages were incorporated into Alessar's new realm. During his reign, Alessar comes north to dwell in Anumanas on several occasions, often using that time to meet his old friends from the Shire. Speaking of the Shire, 
a lesser makes it an independent protectorate of the reunited kingdom, and that no man will enter without permission. He also makes the Shire's positions of Thane, Master of Buckland, and Mayor of Mickledelving as official counsellors to the Northern Realm. Alessa also cedes the land between the Far Downs and the Tower Hills to the Shire, and that land becomes known as the West March. The Fourth Age also sees the dawn of a new era for Rohan. Eomer is officially crowned as King, starting the third line of the Kings of Rohan. During his long reign, the horses and men of Rohan multiply in the mountain dales and grassy fields, and Rohan enters its most prosperous period since the days of King Folkwine, over a hundred years earlier. In some versions of the text, the Rohirrim begin to settle the wide lands of Enedwaith, and they extend their northern border past the River Limlight, and to the southern edge of Lothlorien. A colony of dwarves led by Gimli is also established in Rohan, in the glittering caves behind the fortress of Helm's Deep. That's not to say that war is entirely left behind. Although some were quick to make peace with the reunited kingdom, many of Sauron's former subjects remained hostile to the west, and King Alessa was forced to fight wars in the far-off plains of Rune and the deserts of Harad. In these actions, King Eomer always followed loyally, and the green banner of Rohan could be seen, and the thundering of hooves could be heard in the far-off places of Middle-earth. King Alessa will finally die aged 210 in 120 of the Fourth Age. He will be succeeded by his son, Eldarion, who rules for another hundred years after him, dying around 220 of the Fourth Age at the age of 220. After him, the lifespans of the House of Telkontar will lessen until they become that of other men, and the last light of Numenor will flicker away. But it's said that a hundred generations will follow Eldarion, and that his descendants will become the kings of many lands and peoples. Unfortunately, their heroic deeds during the Fourth Age were lost to time, and to the changing of the world. The Dominion of Men has consequences for Middle-earth's other races. Without the power of their Dark Lord to sustain them, creatures like orcs, wargs, and trolls will fight amongst themselves, dwindle, and gradually retreat from the open places of the world, hiding in the depths of forests or mountain caves. They will still be a threat for many years to come, but the days of massive hordes of orcs and packs of wilds terrorising the wilderness will soon come to an end. But unfortunately, elves and dwarves are also destined for the same fate. The dwarves will at least have one final golden era. The destruction of Sauron and the fading of his minions will give them the opportunity to reclaim their mountain halls, whether it be from orcs, dragons or other creatures. For the Longbeards of Erebor, the defeat of Durin's Bane will finally make it possible to reclaim khazad this is eventually achieved by King Durin VII, who was either the son of King Thorin III Stonehelm or one of his descendants. It's said that, at least for a time, khazad will prosper once again, and the bells will be heard underneath the mountains until Durin's folk dwindle and fade away into legend. For elves, the decline will be much swifter. The destruction of the One Ring causes the three elven rings to lose their power, and now the fading of the elven realms can no longer be delayed. Galadriel and Elrond pass over the sea, and many of the remaining elves soon follow suit. By Alessar's death in 120 of the Fourth Age, Lothlorien has been completely abandoned, and Rivendell is partially, if not completely abandoned too. Only in Lindon do some high elves linger, awaiting the day when Círdan builds the last ship and sets sail as well. For a while, the wood elves who live in the fully reclaimed forest of Erin Lesgalen will prosper, and possibly increase in number. But the fading of the elves will eventually catch up to them as well, and they will retreat deeper into their forests and homes, and eventually, all that will be left will be overgrown ruins and voiceless, wandering spirits. What happens beyond the early years of the Fourth Age is unknown to us. The wars, the peoples, the events, all a mystery. What we do know is that after the Fourth Age, the ages quicken, and the world of Arthur begins to change rapidly. Somewhere, perhaps in the Fifth Age, Arthur begins to look similar to the world we recognise from our own history, giving rise to new heroes and new villains. But that's outside the jurisdiction of my channel. So from myself, this has been War in Middle Earth, and thank you for watching. I would like to thank everyone who has watched War in Middle Earth, whether it was the whole series or just a single episode. When I first started the series in March 2020, I had no idea what it would eventually look like. I had no idea if people would keep watching, and I had no idea if I would ever finish it. When I released the first episode covering the first battles of Beleriand, covering things like the War of the Ring seemed so distant that it wasn't even worth thinking about at the time. To actually finish it is monumental for me, 
It's taken almost two years. The combined scripts are well over 100,000 words and the combined playtime is close to eight hours. There were times when I didn't have motivation. There were episodes that I wasn't particularly interested in covering and to be honest, these videos have been far from my best performing ones. But I have to say that in the end, it was definitely worth it. It feels like I've achieved something and I have you guys, the audience, to thank for that. I'm excited for what is next. Finishing this series gives me more time to make other videos and to perhaps start other series as well. So for the final time on War in Middle Earth, cheers, farewell, and remember, I'm eternally grateful for your support.